Hello friends. This is Steve from the Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern Illinois. Welcome to Text Talks. Today we're going to be talking about truth. A conversation with some friends this past week led me to the question of what do Christians mean when they're talking about truth? It's an important subject for us. We talk about it a lot. But what is truth? And what do we really mean when we use that word? Well, when I began exploring this question, um, I found the answers that I saw in books and on, on the internet uh, to be incomplete, superficial. So I went back to the basics. And for me, that means I started with a word search of the Bible looking at the word truth and the different words in the original language that were it, that are translated as truth and began looking for patterns. Then after I'd completed that process, I um, compared my observations to those of commentators to see what patterns they saw in how the authors of the Bible use the words that we today translate as truth. The results were surprising to me, and so that's why I'm sharing them with you. So let's dive in here. What is truth? First of all, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the words that are translated truth are uh, come from a root verb that means to be firm, to be reliable. It's used for foundations rocks. And it is applied first to God and then to men. God is described as being firm, reliable, and trustworthy. This is one of his basic characteristics. And men are true when they share this characteristic. They reflect this characteristic of God. There's nothing abstract or theoretical about this use of the word truth. God is truth. A man is true. So let's look at some examples here. Uh, first of all, Exodus 34, 4, verses 6 and 7. Pull out your Bible and read with me. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. This is a story of Moses when he went up into Mount Sinai the second time. The first time God had cut out tablets of stone with his own finger, written on them, and handed them to Moses. This time he asked Moses to bring the tablets of stone with him. So Moses is lugging these pieces of rock up the mountain, and he gets there, and um, let's just read the story. I'm going to start with verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generations. Look at the characteristics of God that are, are listed here. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, abundant in truth, there's nothing theoretical about those characteristics. God doesn't have truth. He is truth in the same way that he is merciful, long-suffering, and gracious. Now flip over to Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. For he is our rock. Remember what the root word of that's translated truth it is firm, 
unmovable and it's applied to rocks. He is our rock. This is a play on words. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. Justice. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So once again, God is, truth is a characteristic of God. It is who he is, not something that he has. Now let's look at it, the same, same words applied to men. Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. This is taken from the story when Joseph was distributing authority throughout the camp. Instead of serving as the tribal leader that everybody came to for judgment and for decisions, he was appointing leaders throughout the camp. And this was the advice that his father-in-law gave him. Moreover, Thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place, over, place such over them to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Once again, this is a characteristic, not something that they have. They are truth. They don't have truth. And then Second Samuel Sorry, 1 Samuel. I know it says 2nd, but I really meant 1 Samuel. Chapter 12 and verse 24. First Samuel 12 and verse 24. This is Samuel talking to the people uh, when they... demanded a king of him, and he's giving them advice. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. When you understand that this word is a characteristic, serve him in truth, that means serve him faithfully. Not serve him within the context of a body of beliefs, but to serve him faithfully, be firm, be trustworthy. So that's the pattern I found in the Old Testament. And uh, when I looked at the commentaries, uh, this, was, this was confirmed in, in their um, assessments. What about in the New Testament? Okay, In the New Testament, the word that is used in the Greek does not mean firm, unmovable. The word means what is real versus what only appears to be real or what is a false pretense. In the Gospels, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in the book of Acts, uh, truth is usually uh, tied tied to truth speaking, the veracity of what what is being said, uh, and most often in the Gospels it's used as in an idiomatic fashion, uh, meaning it's not literal. It's a pattern of spe figure of speech. So, fourteen verse thirty three is an example of this use of the word truth. So this is from the story of Jesus calming, uh, of Peter walking on the water when Jesus came uh, walking out into the middle of the storm. And uh, as soon as Jesus came into the ship, they arrived on the other side of the lake and in verse 3 to 33, it says, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. That of a truth is the idiom that we're talking about. And it has to do with truly, 
This is, this is real. You really are the Son of God. Now, when we get to the writings of Paul, he uses it in that sense sometimes, but he also uses truth in a new way. Truth is God's revealed will, especially as it is revealed in Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 is an example of this usage by Paul. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This word of truth. Okay, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was speaking of, it, speaking of that truth there in the Old Testament um, form. I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and Paul, when he is speaking of truth as God's revealed will, especially in Jesus, he's referring back to this. He's not talking about Jesus as a theory, theoretical or as an abstract concept. He's talking about Jesus as the manifestation of the character and the will of God. God's character is truth. His will in our lives is truth. When we look at the Jonin writings, the writings of John, so this is the Gospel of John, the letters of John, and Revelation, here, truth is used in a different way. It's used to refer to the ultimate reality, what is ultimately true. Um, and an example of this usage is uh, in, Jesus, in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, where he's talking about Jesus. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then uh, in John eighteen thirty seven. John 18, verse 37. This is at the, in Jesus' interview with Pilate. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I brought, born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. In chapter 1, John asserts that Jesus was full of grace and truth. In chapter 18, Jesus says that he came to bear witness to truth, to reveal truth, and that everyone who accepts this ultimate reality of truth will hear his voice. Now, I have just this has been a speed read, a cliff's notes of the patterns that I found in Scripture. Search it out for yourself. Doing a word search is elementary Bible study. Every Christian should be able to do it. Today we have the tools. Either you can go to the library and get Strong's Concordance, which has the words printed out, or you can get software, download an app on your smartphone, or go to the library and on the web look, for, uh, look at Bible tools that allow you to do word searches. Okay. Do a word search of truth yourself and, and test what I have been saying. But as I looked at all of this, of how the word truth is used in the Bible, I realized that we as Christians today use it in a very different sense. When we're talking about truth, we usually aren't talking about a characteristic of God. Well, God is truthful. We trust him. 
But when we say the truth, we're not talking about God. We're talking about a system of beliefs, a group of doctrines when we refer to truth. And when we argue about truth, that's what we're talking about. How did we get from the way the Bible talks about truth to today? Well, it, it comes, comes around to the patterns of truth finding that you find in Western culture. Now, I have listed three. There are other ways of truth finding that are evidenced in Western culture. And if you study philosophy, you can spend years trying to wrinkle through all of the, the arguments and permutations and counter arguments um, regarding how to determine whether something is true or not. I have listed these because these are the patterns of truth finding that I see evidenced in the, my life and in the lives of the people around me. And it comes, basically comes down to three patterns or three theories of truth. The first is the correspondence theory. The correspondence theory says that something is true if it corresponds with a fact. Truth derives from facts. This is the basis of the scientific method. Truth derives from facts. And it's interesting that Christians use this pattern of truth finding a lot. It's just that we use texts as facts. When we appeal to the Bible, when we quote the Bible, we are quoting a religious fact. And we are asserting that something is true because it corresponds to the facts. Now, the coherence theory finds, determines what is true through a different method. Basically, the coherence theory asks, is this statement, this belief, co part of a coherent system of beliefs, or is it isolated or part of a fragmented, contradictory uh, group of beliefs? Truth is something that is part of a coherent system of beliefs. Now, you see this all the time, okay? When we talk about the silos that are built on Facebook of only listening to voices that agree with us, we're talking about coherence. When we talk about fake media that spins everything to fit a narrative, we're talking about co the coherence theory of truth manipulated, okay? Do Christians use this? I think we do. If somebody tells us what they believe, we first ask ourselves, is that what I believe? And if the answer is no, if their truth does not fit with my coherent system of beliefs, then it's not true. The pragmatic theory of truth it takes a completely different foundation for determining what is true. It starts with our experience. Something is true if it's consistent with life as we as have experienced it. Now, this takes truth down to a personal level. My truth is... What is true for me is tied to what I've, I have experienced. At the, group, uh, at the group level, the more of us that share the same experiences, the more of us accept something as true. So people out in rural areas have a shared body of experiences, and they accept certain political 
statements as true that people in a suburban area are less likely to accept. It's not because they're stupid. They just have a different experience. And the simple fact is that in Western culture today, uh, experience largely trumps facts and system of beliefs. Um, we talk about the relativism that has infiltrated Western culture. I'm okay, you're okay. Well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. That is all the application of the pragmatic theory of truth that is permeating, that permeates Western culture. Does this permeate Christian culture in the West? I think it does. I think it does very much. Our experience strongly influences what we are willing to consider as true or not. And the experience of our peer group, the people we identify, strongly influences what we think of as true. So that's a description of the patterns that we see in the culture around us and in, in our lives. How does this correlate with the Bible? Well, do we find any of these patterns of truth finding in the Bible? First, let's look at the correspondence theory of truth. Um, Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. In Adventist circles, in my subset of Christianity, this is a famous passage, okay? Because we are big about the Bible and using the Bible as the foundation for our beliefs. So, Isaiah 8 and verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. To the law and to the testimony, an appeal to textual facts, to appeal to religious facts. Okay, that's the correspondence theory if I ever saw it. Now, in the New Testament, I want to point you to Luke chapter 24. Once again, this is just the Cliff Notes version, a quick survey of, of some evidences that I saw. Oh, I'm using the correspondence theory of truth, aren't I? I'm giving you texts, evidences. I don't know why Christians have such a problem with science, because the truth is we use the same method of finding truth that scientists do. We just argue about which facts are significant. Okay, verse 20, chapter 24 and verse 27. This is from the story of the walk to Emmaus. Jesus, after his resurrection, appears to do two disciples who are walking out of Jerusalem to their home. And they don't recognize them, and the conversation strikes up. And in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Here Jesus is going through the scriptures, the Old Testament, and giving evidences through all the scriptures, showing the disciples, see, this talks about me, this talks about me, this talks about me. He's providing facts to support the truth that he is the Messiah. So, correspondence theory of truth, we find that in the Bible, even though the word truth is never used. Okay, what about the coherence? Truth, determining truth by whether it agrees with a coherent system of beliefs. Turn with me here to Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. The book of Galatians was written to a church of Gentiles. Paul had raised up this church. They were baptized with, as Christians. They had the Holy Spirit. But then some 
other Christians came in and said, oh, no, 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 you are not true Christians unless you have also uh, been circumcised uh, and did you, you're all doing all of these other Jewish rituals, all of these other rituals that are part of the Jewish system. That's a topic for another day, okay? But that's the context of this, okay? And in verses 8 and 9, Paul says to them, As we said before, no, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Boy, he's forceful there. Measure truth by what you've been taught. If it doesn't agree with what you've been taught, it's not true. So, is the coherence theory of truth finding present in the Bible? Absolutely. But the pragmatic theory isn't there, right? There's not an appeal to experience. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to determine truth based on whether it agrees with Scripture and whether it agrees with what we've been taught. Hmm. Well, let's look. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And I know just by my de demeanor you feel like I'm setting you up, and I am, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. The truth is that the pragmatic theory of truth-finding is all through Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and to thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord, the God, thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. All through the Old Testament, this experience of standing at the foot of, of Mount Sinai and hearing the voice of God, declaring the Ten Commandments and making a covenant with them. This was the foundation of the entire Jewish religious experience. It was a pragmatic theory of truth finding. It was both personal and group. The people who were there experienced it, but they taught it to their children. They told the story to their children, and their children told the story to their children's children, and generations later, they were still telling the same story, and it was the foundation of their truth. Now, in today's culture, we tend to emphasize personal experience and to discredit the experience of others. That's a difference here. But this pragmatic theory of truth-finding is definitely biblical. Experience is the foundation of truth. Our experience of God is the foundation of truth. In the New Testament, I just want, you to, point, want to point you to one passage, Acts 2, verse 32. Acts 2, verse 32. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He's talking to the crowd that is gathered around as the disciples are speaking in tongues and people from all over the Roman, the Roman Empire are being able to understand and hear the gospel in their own language. And they're rather astonished at it. Okay? Acts 2, verse 32. And Peter's speaking to this crowd, and he says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. We all experienced it. We saw. And other places, uh, the apostles spoke of 
we saw, we teach, we are teaching you what we saw and what we heard. Personal experience is the foundation of the entire New Testament. It's what the apostle, where the apostles gained their authority. It was the authority of having having had personal experience with Jesus. So how do I deal with this? Okay. We read the Bible and we do a word search and we find out that truth is a characteristic of God. It's not a theory of belief. It's not a belief at all. It's a characteristic of God. God is truth. So when Jesus says he is the truth, he was saying he was God. He was saying the same thing about him. I am trustworthy. I'm reliable. I'm firm. But we don't use the word that way today. I find two, two takeaway points, okay? Number one, our culture spends a lot of time arguing over beliefs. Christians spend a lot of time arguing over beliefs. But beliefs are not truth, as the Bible uses the word. Truth exists in my life when my life is in accordance with who God is. Truth does not derive from my beliefs. Truth derives from my accordance with God. God is truth, and I either, either reflect him in my life, or I don't. The more that I reflect God in my life, the more truth is in me. This is a radically different way of looking at truth than when we're talking about doctrines, or when we're studying truth. Maybe we need to look at God more than we look at beliefs, and maybe we need to measure every belief against the character of God. Second takeaway, truth is not about right and wrong. It isn't. God is who God is. It's about what is real and what is not. Now let me illustrate here, okay? In Fairfield, there are nine roads that lead out of Fairfield, okay? Every other, every other road in town is connected to these nine roads, and to get out of Fairfield, you have to take one of these nine roads. Now, you and I can argue about which one of those roads leads to St. Louis, But the truth is, I can get to St. Louis by going out of town on any one of those roads. Every one of those roads will connect me to St. Louis. That is what is. There's no right or wrong about that. It's simply what is. And if we're arguing about, well, you need to take this road to go St. Louis and this road to go Evansville and if we're arguing about which is right and which is wrong, we're not arguing about truth. Because the truth is, I can take any one of those roads. God is the what is of Christianity. He is our firm rock, our reliable, strong, strong right arm, our trustworthy friend. The being who created us to be like him, who became one of us so that we could understand who he is, who died so that he could break the chains that bind us and make us incapable of being like him. And until my life reflects who he is, the re ultimate reality, the truth as it is in Jesus, everything else is a distraction. When we study doctrines, we should be studying them 
as facets of who God is and trying to understand the character of God. It's not about right and wrong. It's about knowing God. Jesus even told us this. This is the will of God, that ye know him and Jesus Christ who he sent. Anyhow, that's where my search this week led me after the conversation with my friends kind of surprised me. I didn't expect to end up here, but I found something that was deeply meaningful to me spiritually and religiously. Test for yourself. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you around.